because what people are doing in these functional training gyms is doing the things that you would do in your backyard carrying stones and weakening you and weakening the joint and compromising the joint in this very insidious way, time after time, workout after workout. And then you go to actually do something like that in your backyard, and that's when the straw breaks. And you're thinking, oh, I don't understand. I was preparing for this, and now I get hurt. Or you get hurt in a gym before that even happens. Because the thing is, when you're not doing things in a biomechanically correct way, you're wearing away and you're weakening the joint. And functional training is serving to, to, to screw you up. Episode 39 of the Inform Fitness Podcast with Adam Zickerman is about to begin. Hey, Inform Nation, thanks for joining us. I am Tim Edwards with the Inbound Podcasting Network and a client of Inform Fitness. Adam, Mike, and Sheila will be with us in just a minute, and they'll be joined by a longtime Inform Fitness client, David Carlson. The discussion today is based off of a blog post written by Adam a few years back titled, Gyms Have Become Dangerous Playgrounds for Grownups. The blog post stems from the functional fitness movement and for those who subscribe to the notion that we should train and strengthen our bodies in ways that mimic the activities of our daily life. So what are the dangers of participating in this form of exercise? Well, you can read the blog post for yourself at informfitness.com. And we begin the discussion right now here on the Inform Fitness Podcast. Yes. So, you know, we talk about we talk about theory a lot and a lot of... Uh, you know, academic things from time to time. And it's always good to just come, come back to, uh, you know, where the rubber meets, meets the road and, and talk to people that are actually experiencing this and, and this type of workout. And when we, uh, have talked about functional training in the past and how this, you know, my opinion is that you strength train to build muscle and then you uh, and you do that in the safest way possible according to muscle and joint function as best as you can and not necessarily try to mimic everyday life in the gym which is what a lot of functional trainers are doing doing things that you kind of do in everyday life and but in the gym you're doing with weights or or extra resistance and I've always said that that's dangerous for the joints and the way you incorporate your life well, the way the way exercise helps you in your life is by again safely strengthening muscles according to its as best you can according to its its function and not to try to get fancy. So, I was reminded of this when I was talking to David, a client, a longtime client. David's here with me right now. Hello, David. Hi. Thanks for having me. Glad to be here. <laughs> now, Hi, David. Now, Hi. Adam, before you bring uh, David in as a longtime yeah. client, let's also let our audience know that David also has produced several videos for you over there on the East Coast. Yes, David is very well aware of our workout. He's intimately aware because he is producing videos with us, and he obviously is getting the technical background and all this stuff, obviously, in order to shoot it properly. So, yes, he's a client, and uh, he just keeps learning more and more about it. And we were having a conversation yesterday uh, about how he was doing some work in his backyard and all this kind of stuff. And it made me think exactly of the point we've been making all this time about separating everyday life activities and not necessarily trying to mimic those activities in the gym. And David is pretty much living proof of how this works. And, and it was based on what he was telling me yesterday that kind of prompted me to invite him here today with us. So David, tell us what you we're talking about yesterday. So I have this house in Pennsylvania and, um, it's really great. Cause I, th I think this, I, you know, I do yard work. The one thing that I keep on, uh, I'm reminded all the time of how, how effective this workout is. So last week I was in, in Pennsylvania and I was harvesting, I don't know, these big stones to make these path stones on my property. And they're probably like 50, 65 pounds each. They're pretty heavy. Mm. And I know that, you know, I'm in pretty good shape cause I've been doing this workout for probably about four and a half years. But still, something like that, you know, it really, it made me think like, you got to be really careful about this because you're picking up a big piece of stone from the ground, you're lifting it up, your back is in, you know, could be in real trouble. But of course, because I do this work now, I'm actually even more focused on these kind of things when they come into my world. So, you know, I like, I held my stomach and I picked it up and I did this all day and it was like, and I could do it, but you know, it was really, really, they were really, really difficult. At the end of the day, when I had those stones laid out, I thought to myself, 
you know, I'm really lucky I do this work workout because if I had not done this workout, I think this whole day would have killed me, <laughs> you know, just, just laying out those stones. And the funny thing about it, at the end of the day, I was a little sore because it was a little awkward, you know, the, yeah. the positions I were in, I was in a couple of times and, and I felt it, but I didn't feel destroyed. Mm-hmm. And I thought to myself, man, if I had done this and I wasn't in this kind of shape, I would, I, I don't think I, I don't think I'd be in good shape. So came and I told Adam about this because I was super excited about it because I thought to myself, I have to do this workout so you can do life. <laughs> you know, that's the thing you never think about. You think I've heard people talk about, oh, you can have this like really active lifestyle and you can, you know, like you can, you know, lift rocks and things and you'd be in great shape. No, that's going to kill you. The only way you can do that is if you are in great shape first, and then you can do this work without it killing you. See what I was happy about hearing that that's the kind of the, the thing that made the light bulb go off in my head. Mm-hmm. He figured it out. Usually I have to kind of teach that, that correlation, which usually people have reversed. He realized that you don't exercise that way to prepare for that, which so many people do, which is what this whole functional create functional training craze is all about. Like you have people lifting tires and carrying rocks across football fields and <laughs> anvils and sandbags and, and swinging ropes and kettlebells and all those things, which do in some ways mimic things that you do in life, like David carrying boulders around his backyard to, to plant a garden and things like that. The misnomer is that you have to do those similar type of activities with, with weights and in, in the gym so you can prepare you for what he did in the backyard. And no, because what he was doing in the backyard ultimately is not good for you. If he kept doing that over and over again, day after day, like a manual laborer does, he's going to have problems. He's going to have physical problems. Whereas working out with us or in a way that's according to muscle and joint function, whether it's with us or not, right, is just doing according to muscle and joint function is going to prepare you for when you do have to remove a rock, that it's not going to be the straw that breaks the camel's back. Because what people are doing in, in, in these functional training gyms is doing the things that you would do in your backyard carrying stones and weakening you and weakening the joint and compromising the joint in this very insidious way, time after time, week workout after workout. And then you go to actually do something like that in your backyard, and that's when the straw breaks. And you're thinking, oh, I don't understand. I was preparing for this, and now I get hurt. Or you get hurt in a gym before that even happens. Because the thing is, when you're not doing things in a biomechanically correct way, you're wearing away and you're weakening the joint. And functional training is serving to, to, to screw you up. So here... David is working out, doing a very safe leg press, doing the deltoids according to muscle and joint function, and the resistance is at the right weight at the right time, not too heavy at the weak point, not too light at the strong point, not screwing up the rotator cuff muscles, not screwing up the the joint itself and all the connective tissue of that joint by doing things on long levers uh, where the weight is way too heavy and and, and the stabilized muscles have to carry way too much load than they were meant to, and then... And by not doing that, by just strengthening the muscle, he was prepared to, to lift boulders in his backyard. And there was no straw that broke the camel's back. Yeah. So that's what really kind of was yeah. impressed upon me Bas- when he was telling basically me that story. The, uh, basically, the, uh, the point of this, I think, is that life, the majority of our life is, in fact, outside of muscle and joint function. And, uh, and when we try to incorporate some of those uh, it, those things into our exercise. You're, you know, an exercise, on, an exactly. exercise regimen is something that is repetitive. You know, whether it's once a week or three times a week or whatever p- people do. But to do certain things like carry boulders, which we want to be able to do when we have to do them within our within means. But uh, that is a uh, it's a great it's a great testimonial to come to that conclusion because a lot of people don't really come to that uh, <laughs> even after we tell them over and over and over yeah. again. Yeah, yeah. Uh, usually, usually it's like you know. Uh, how is this helping me with doing all my gardening, right? Don't I, shouldn't I be doing things like I do in the backyard and gardening? Shouldn't I be jumping off boxes because that's kind of what happens when you kind of run after a bus or something like that? Shouldn't I be doing those <laughs> kinds of ballistic movements to prepare me for the ballistic movements of life? And I'm like, no. Yeah. <laughs> it, it, the thing is, these no. things do, these things do occur in in life, and I think when we know something that is uh, that can be destructive or risky. Uh, and as we get older, things become that way. We have to make sure we v- are very careful with what, which, w- with which ones we decide to do at that time in our life. And I think uh, you know, you so you knew that you could 
probably do this. But as you said before, if you were doing this all of the time, or as Adam said, if yeah. you did this, had to do this as a job all the time, you probably would hurt yourself, even if you were uh, very strong. Yeah. Because yeah. You're, you're making it, in essence, an exercise if you're doing it all the time. Sure. And I, and I, I guarantee you that I probably wouldn't even try to have done it <laughs> if, <laughs> if I had not been, if I hadn't felt strong. I mean, one of the things I have to say about this workout, it always, it always makes me feel really strong. Like I just feel like okay, I'm gonna op- I'm gonna I'm a cameraman, so I'm carrying around gear all the time. The reason I, you know, the reason I I maybe I got this is because I came to this workout hoping to cure those kind of things. Like I remember I couldn't carry gear; I was getting tired, and and then after about three months, I realized I started gaining the strength, and then in my job became a lot easier. And then I started going like, oh holy hell, this is gonna make this is gonna bring back my life. You know, I'm, I see that window. I pull it down. As I pull it down, I go, oh, my God, my core did that so easily. Sheila, reminds me of the story <laughs> yeah. with Fitz, Fitzpatrick, the bass oh, player for, for, the cult, for the cult, right? Grant Fitzpatrick, yeah. the bass player for the cult. And he basically ruined his back was so bad that he couldn't even – it was threatening his career, his his career playing bass on stage, you know, with traveling with bands and playing bass. He couldn't stand. He couldn't walk around. Um, his brother actually had a facility with this type of workout, this type of equipment, got him to get on the low back machine, which you're like, what? Why would you go on the low back machine when your back is in, you know, in bad shape? Um, but his brother, knowing the benefits of this can, you know, convince him to try it. And, and it was the thing that made him better and able to come back in his career and get back out on stage again. And so when he was traveling with, um, the cult, he, he would like every city he would go to, he would look for this equipment. That's how he found us in LA by finding that we had this certain type of equipment and, and he wanted that low back machine. That was like his, that's his cure, you know, to come in and do that low back machine. And then when he's in New York, he, he's called you guys several times and gone in there. And that's, he has to keep doing that in order to stay um, viable, you know, able to continue because his back has, once you have a back thing and it's been in that, you know, uh, condition where it's, you're, you're so scared. People are scared. Adam, you know, this whole, we all have had that whole low back episode with you, Adam. And it's like, it's the, the fear factor. So they don't move. But once you understand that the exercise is going to strengthen your back and make it better, Mm -hmm. then you're, you're like, okay, I got to keep doing this. Um, one thing I wanted to just say about what Dave was saying that I thought was very important is that simply by doing this exercise, you become much more aware of safely doing things, of safely Mm -hmm. lifting very heavy weights. You become much more aware of that perfect form. And then that, that alone makes you much more aware when you're even moving a piece of furniture in your house or something. It's true. I'm sure David would like bending your knees properly. And yeah, even in New York, I mean, I find myself checking with checking in with myself as I'm walking upstairs, I'm feeling myself moving and, mechanically in ways that are just sort of supporting me. They're not they're You know, I'm careful. I'm careful because of this workout. I mean, it, it, it does come through in everyday life all the time. We actually had one new client. She was a, a younger girl and <laughs> she came in twice. And then she was, uh, she sent John, her trainer, a text saying, um, I think I'm taller. <laughs> that said, happens all the time. I'm taller. Can you measure me? And and it was I was reading something about the benefits of when you start strength training, and part of that is that you're standing a little taller because you're aware of your muscles. Posture's it. I mean, I'm I'm gonna jump on that because that that's been a huge change for me. So like after I leave this place, I'm standing up in this very tall position. I'm walking around thing. It's it's a, sort of like all of a sudden my my musculature is holding my frame up. I just feel it like supporting me. It's sort of like this angel comes behind you and mm-hmm. grabs your shoulders and sort of holds it up for you to show you like <laughs> this is where you should be all your life. Right. And, and, and I've noticed that even like if I want to get that feeling back during the week, if I just put myself into like a uh, like a plank position for, you know, until I almost go to failure, if I stand up, I'm brought up into the same position again. It lifts me up. So it's like if I want that inst- instant fix – I just go to that, and all of a sudden, I feel like I'm like two inches taller. I do feel that. 
That's awesome. So, yeah, it was a very exciting thing. And so as you bring it up, that's that's one very exciting thing that I've 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 actually passed on to other people. I've told other people about. Because I'm generally like my whole life has been like this, you know. So you know, functional training, the concept of functional training was so good and it worked. Then things like Grand Fitzpatrick. Uh, mm. and, and carrying a heavy guitar on his shoulders all the time would be strengthening his back, not hurting his back. It wasn't until he started right. doing according to muscle and joint function to truly strengthen back the right way that it made him feel better. But functional training is saying mimic the activities of life that, you know, so you can handle it. So he's like, okay, I'm just going to carry this really heavy guitar on my shoulders and that should solve my back problems, right? No, it's actually causing his back problems. Reminds me of the bar owner that I trained for the last, I don't know, eight years. Kirk, if you're listening, hello. Mm. You know, Kirk owns bars. He's carrying kegs all the time, up and down these stairs. He's big kegs. Half of carrying a keg is technique, if you've ever seen one of those guys pulling it off a truck. But they're heavy, those things, right? He was not getting stronger lifting kegs all day, all right? And those guys that are heaving those kegs up and down on trucks, they, are, they have a lot of problems, all right? It wasn't until he started doing, again, his work out here that he was able to handle that kind of work. So if functional training was valid, wouldn't all those really tough work that you're doing all day long, wouldn't that be making you stronger and healthier and not, not making you decrepit and, and crooked? If you just think about it for a second, it doesn't make sense, the whole functional training movement, as, as they basically stole that term. Remember, functional training came from rehabilitation, where you're injured and you can't do some very basic things and you just practice not just from a strengthening point of view, but from an even neurological point of view, a tactile point of view. You got to learn how to do a function yeah, again. It's more like occupational therapy. Occupational yeah. therapy, mm. physical therapy. It's about getting back to a certain level and then going from there. But once you get back to being able to move that joint appropriately, then you got to strengthen after that. Right. And 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 whether whether it's a, a movement pattern like uh, like in a job, like moving a keg or picking up rocks. Or a sports uh, move, you learn technique to make it more efficient. If it's something that you do have to do on a regular basis, like he still has to move kegs, uh, like an athlete still mm -hmm. has to, you know, run across the field, jump up in the air, catch a ball, or something like that. And the idea is you want to learn how to do that activity as efficiently and with as much technical expertise, which you know we learn how to do. It, and and when Part of that is how to do it without hurting yourself or to minimize risk, uh, I, sh I should say, because oftentimes a lot of things uh, like in sports, for example, that are require extreme ranges of motion uh, in order to do the actual sport. There's an expectation that you're going to uh, that you may actually hurt yourself in the process of doing so. Again, here we are. You know, you just touched upon something, Mike. That that is something we've touched upon before, and it, it it's definitely worth repeating because it, it it's it's a basic tenet of what we're talking about, and that is the difference between recreation and exercise. And sports is part of that recreation. And athletes, just like the bartender or the bar owner, I should say, and just like the musician. Uh, you, the athlete uh, is also putting himself in compromising positions during his sport, for his sport. And again, to train in those compromising positions is just going to be piling on and just adding to the pro propensity for, for a risk of getting injured. What that athlete should be doing, instead of working in these extreme ranges of motion to try to mimic what's happening, let's say, on a basketball court. While they're training while they're training, I'm saying, is to just strengthen the muscle appropriately according to muscle and joint functions, avoiding the extremes, avoiding the excessive force that's going to wear insidiously, possibly, wear and tear away at the joints. And then they get hurt during the game. And it's hard to prove, right, that what the cause was. But more than likely, it's all that plyometric, quote-unquote, functional training that they're trying to mimic. And really what they're doing According to, it's you know, wearing it down, wearing everything down. Yeah, it, you know, to me, exercising like that all the time is not exercise. It's manual labor. We all know manual laborers are not necessarily in the greatest health as as they as they age. Actually, yeah, that that's the initial conversation we had about that was the difference between manual labor and, and exercise. I was thinking about so that. getting paid to have somebody do. Maybe we should change the whole uh, idea of it and just. People will pay so that they can exercise, but then we'll get work done at the same time. 
Well, exactly. <laughs> That's you a know? good point. You know, so for all of you that are doing all these functional training workouts, the boot camps, the CrossFits, you know what? Become become a construction worker and yeah. and, 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 and add some value to society at least. Go lay bricks. <laughs> yeah. if, you're, if you're gonna beat yourself up, beat yourself up at least. Have something come from it, <laughs> you know, as opposed to just beating yourself up and not having any value come from. Learn it. a craft. You're saying. Yeah, learn a craft. Like uh, you know, it's, it's still manual labor, except you're you're actually accomplishing something. So, Adam, I just wanted yeah. to go back to maybe give the listeners a little 101 in biomechanical movement. And you talked earlier, you just mentioned long levers. So mm. could you just kind of explain, give an example of a long lever and how well, that would hurt? Well, your thing is, when you have a weight in your hand, for example, uh, and you're lifting it, uh, your arm is the lever, right? So... Uh, and the thing is, what a lever does is it multiplies the weight that you're holding by the length of that lever. So if you're doing, let's say, side raises with a dumbbell to work your deltoids, so you're holding a dumbbell by your sides and you're just lifting your arms straight out from your sides with a, with a locked out elbow, so it's a straight arm, all right? What you have to keep in mind is, and what you have to know is, where the deltoid, the, the the muscle that you're working, your shoulder muscle, where its strong point is and where its weak point is. And the weight should be heaviest at the strong point of the deltoid and it should be lighter at the weak point because if the weight is too heavy at the weak point of the deltoid, that's where other things need to hold up that weight. And those other things like connective tissue and rotator cuff muscles, stabilizer muscles, smaller stabilizer muscles, they can't handle all that extra weight. So it's important to match how the weight changes through a range of motion and make sure that it's changing in accordance to the strength levels of that muscle that it's working. So what's happening here when you do a lateral raise like that, the deltoid is strongest when you start the movement, when it's by your sides. That's where your deltoid is really strong. But that's also where the weight is not really being multiplied by a long lever because it's not out yet. So it's the weight itself multiplied by the small maybe an inch that it is away from your side. But then when you pull it away from your side, your deltoid is getting weaker. And that weight, as it's going away from your body, the further it gets away from your body, you have to multiply that weight by that distance. And the further and further it gets away from your body, that weight gets heavier and heavier. At the same time, as your arm is going away from your body, your deltoid, your shoulder muscle, is getting weaker and weaker. So the, here you have what they call an incongruency, where the weight is way too heavy at that point for the muscle. See, what people might not understand is that the muscle doesn't have the same strength through a range of motion. It's stronger at the beginning of the range of motion and usually gets weaker at the end of the range of motion. And the weight has to vary accordingly. And if it doesn't, if it, it varies the wrong way, where it gets heavier, where the muscle gets weaker, that's when you run into problems. And that's what happens very often when we don't lift weights according to our muscle and joint function. And there's ways to fix that problem. doesn't mean you can't do a lateral raise. You just shouldn't do a lateral raise standing straight up like that. If you lean your body to a 45 degree, degree angle or lay on your side, and you do the lateral raise that way, now you change everything. Now the weight is heaviest at the beginning of the deltoid and where the delta couldn't handle that heavy weight. And then as the weight comes up, as if you're laying on your side, the distance shortens as the deltoid gets weaker and now you have congruent exercise. So it's just a matter of knowing how to shift your body position sometimes to make an exercise from safe to unsafe or, and vice versa. Yeah, that's, I mean, Adam was just speaking in terms of exercise, but like going back to a practical life type of thing, like what David was talking about moving rocks, like, and, and talking about the lever that Adam's talking about, what David was, I guarantee you, I wasn't there, but I guarantee he wasn't, he didn't have his arms extended right. away, far away from his body carrying. He brought along, it close to his body. body. He brought it close right. to his body because it, that technique. Because now you're not multiplying that boulder exactly. by the distance of your arm all exactly. the way away from your body. So the distance of his arm was shorter because he held it closer and therefore he he could actually carry it. If he did it the other way, he would have made the life much harder for himself and would have likely hurt himself no matter how strong he is from this workout. Exactly. So when you see a lot of these movements in boot camps and the CrossFits, you know, when you have medicine balls with outstretched arms twisting to the side, mm. I mean, you're working your obliques minimally, but you're, you're straining your lower back maximally. It, it's not even accomplishing and working the muscle that you're intending. 
And people don't realize that. And you have these trainers that maybe most likely unintentionally are not even understanding of the, of the forces that are involved in something like that. And that's the real danger of this functional training movement when you don't understand uh, that there are going to be excessive forces on a muscle at the wrong time. So I have a little mantra, which, which you know, uh, when, I, when I try to explain all this to my clients as we go through the workout, it's, I always say the right resistance at the right time. And, and that's, that, that's important, and I point that out to them. And sometimes I'll even demonstrate doing a lateral raise in a standing position and then do the lateral raise in, in, in the uh, side position, and they can feel the difference. You can feel how it's straining the shoulder. You can feel how all of a sudden when you make it do it the right way, you feel it just in the deltoid and not feel like your, 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 your shoulder blade or your, 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 your collarbone is about to pop out of, your, out of its socket. And that, the, the problem with, uh, with what, this is not with what Adam is talking about, but once again, the understanding of a lot of people when they exercise is that they associate being really, really sore with a great workout. And that's why sometimes, mm -hmm. you know, like doing uh, extreme range of motion or uh, incongruent exercise oftentimes makes people very sore. And they're like, wow, that was a great workout. And then uh, <laughs> and they go back to it, of course. And so that's the thing that we just want people to be very, very aware of in, their, in if they're not doing what we're doing or if they're doing something similar to what we're doing. Uh, you have to be very aware of these types of things no matter what type of uh, program you're involved with. And um, that's something that we take very, very seriously and we're very vigilant about. Right. And I think one of the classic things people do in that, you know, on that same uh, line of speaking is they reach too far forward to pick something up. You know what I mean? Like they're reaching over and then they pick it up and then, oh God, it's too heavy and your low back is strained. And you know what I mean? They're not like centered in that. It just being aware your whole body is the lever there, <laughs> well, well, you know, that, like your arms outstretched and you're stretching over to pick something up. Don't do it. <laughs> well, it comes back to the workout though. And I like what Dave it's going and it comes full circle to what Dave said in the beginning was that, uh, his awareness for what he was doing when it was outside of muscle and joint function was much more conservative. He actually yeah. did things much mm -hmm. safely in that world because of the awareness he developed from this workout, which is exactly. what we, we do see that. And then, uh, and this is a living proof of it right here. Well, yeah. And one, you know, one of the great things about this place, I have to say that is, uh, has always been about safety. So so I feel like here you get taken care of there. I mean, you can go any other place and people will just lay on that line of advertising they've heard a million times before all over the place that I've never seen any really results from. But um, but here, you know, it's always been safety. It's always right. like we take care of you. And then that starts getting pumped into you. You take care of yourself. You come here to take care of yourself. You know, it's, it's a great. It's thing. You take that out with you. I think. Mm -hmm. Yeah. I'm going to be producing some videos on this stuff and showing biomechanically correct exercises. So stay tuned for that. But in the meantime, until we start producing our videos, you know, I, t I totally recommend that we interviewed Bill DeSimone at one point. Right. And he, has a, he has a whole host of, uh, of, of videos and he has a book called Congruent Exercise. He has several publications now uh, on this subject. So if you want to get really specific and, and do exercises, or reference our podcast, too. Remember, we had a good interview with him. We had an interview with him, but I also recommend you going to Bill D. Simone and, and looking up his his videos. on, on all, And you can see all types of exercise done properly and with explanations of, of why you're doing it this way. And, and start engaging in some very effective but also safe ways of working these muscle groups. And, and, and stay away from the idea of trying to mimic everyday activities, including sports activities, in the gym with weights and long levers, now that you know what a lever does, all right, <laughs> and, and do it safe. And, and like like we talked about with David, you, he kind of intuitively understood that bring the, keep that weight close to your body. And like, you know, Sheila was just referencing about reaching out, outstretched arms with heavy weights. You know, sometimes you just have to do that. It reminds me of... Uh, Myself, when uh, you know I had a reach, and you know you have kids, and you have in the back a seat, and you're reaching behind you to mm -hmm. grab something, and and I just remember, you know, that's not good for your shoulder to reach all the way behind you with an outstretched arm and and pick up this heavy backpack filled with who knows what, you know, and you know I wouldn't recommend people do that for exercise, except you have to do it in real life, and because I strengthen my shoulders and my neck and my arms in a safe way that every once in a while when I have to reach back 
in the back seat of the car and grab something heavy out of it, I can handle it. I don't want to do that on a regular basis, but I don't. I didn't get hurt doing that, and I can still get hurt doing that, depending on how heavy the thing is. But that's how you prepare for everyday life by just making right. sure your shoulders are really strong. So when you do have to reach behind the back seat and grab something heavy, that you can handle it. I, I have one more story. I just want to share with yeah, you. Yeah, and then we'll we'll end with that because I think we. I don't want to beat a dead horse, but I think I think the point has been made, right? So yeah. Go for it. Well, so here this this thing happened. I I never even shared this with anybody, but uh, about a month ago. I was stepping up on the curb, coming home from the, the supermarket. And I had two bags with me. And I stepped on the curb, and I hit the curb incorrectly. And I remember my feet just kind of flipped out. They, it, I did this weird twist. You know you, you know when you fall, you're just like, you see it happening and slow. <laughs> yeah. Oh, God. The weirdest thing was, I'm on the cement, on, you know, and, and I, I tripped. I came down onto the pavement, and my arms just flipped out in front of me. And I put myself into this, like, plank position. <laughs> it was the weirdest thing. It was like a cat, and I hit it. And in that moment, I thought to myself, "Oh my God, I'm glad I'm in shape, because if oh, I weren't so in shape, I would have planted my face right on the cement. Probably, my my arms would have never supported me. In fact, this woman saw me down the street. She came running. She goes, "Are you okay?" And I was like, "Yeah." I mean, I couldn't even believe it. Like, yeah, arms, I just decided to do a plank right now. It was just like I just <laughs> fell into it. It was just the weirdest thing. Spontaneous I, plank with a again, grocery. Yeah, I, just I just planned that. Because I think these are this is one of those miracle moments that you get yeah. that you're not aware of that you get when you do this. I think that's what I wanted to leave it on. Right. That's awesome. I so, love it. Well, let's leave it there then. Yeah. It was a great miracle moment. I would say, come have your own miracle moment. It really is. Worth <laughs> it. I have had several miracle moments. One of the biggest one was I got hit by a car on my uh, bike. Yeah. And I'm not kidding. It's, I just think being like in you know. shape, like I literally flipped over the car. My hip smashed the windshield. Yes. And I rolled over the car and I landed on my feet on the other yeah. side of the car. And oh my God. I mean, really? It was literally like, like. You call him MacGyver now. Jesus. I mean, I had a huge God. confusion on my yeah. hip. But to be honest with you, I was actually totally 100% totally fine. Yeah. And I think. <laughs> Although, Mike, just... if you, I think if you were in better shape, you wouldn't have gotten that abrasion on your hip, though. Yeah, exactly. I should not have but had that it's enormous. Like... <laughs> uh, exactly. It's like the, spi it's it's like the Spider Man it. moment. It was. Like, oh my God. <laughs> it's like I have Spider Man. I have Spider Man but, powers. But there's yeah. a lot of moments like that in the life. And people who are in shape, they, they maybe they don't, they're not that aware of it. But like uh, when you trip and just catch yourself, right. maybe, maybe you're not falling into a plank, but you just step to the side. It's, you know, <laughs> Just having that that <laughs> the, the that ability to make that agile movement is oftentimes as a result of just having adequate strength, you know. We're creating miracles every day. And we invite you to start making miracles inside your own body, making that change with a slow motion, high intensity strength training workout at Inform Fitness. Many thanks to Inform Nation member and longtime Inform Fitness client, David Carlson, for joining us here on the podcast. Adam mentioned at the top of the show that he and David are currently working on filming a series of trainer certification videos. Now, in the past, David has also produced several amazing videos for Inform Fitness, and we'll have links to David's Inform Fitness productions in the show notes. Adam also mentioned earlier that our old friend from episode 19, Bill D. Simone has a great series of videos regarding congruent exercise. Those, too, will appear in the show notes for this episode. And while you're tooling around the show notes, don't forget to check out the link to Amazon to pick up Adam's book, Power of 10, The Once-A-Week Slow-Motion Fitness Revolution. Or how about stopping by an Inform Fitness location nearest you? They have the books there, along with some really cool Inform Fitness apparel, and, of course, your opportunity to try this workout for yourself. To find an Informed Fitness location nearest you, just visit informfitness.com. Now, next week, we'll be joined by Informed Fitness client and New York City theater lighting designer, Ann Wrightson. Looking forward to talking to Ann next week. Until then, for Adam, Mike, and Sheila with Informed Fitness, I'm Tim Edwards with the Inbound Podcasting Network.